There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high quality, grass fed, and grass finished beef, organic chicken, pork raised crate free, and wild caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high-quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at butcherbox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious. And all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips, for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm and use code etm to choose your free offer and get $20 off. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, Right. For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. Can anyone help me answer the question why when somebody asks, you know, what is uniquely American, we tend to name off apple pie, well, because it's good, right? Barbecues on the 4th of July, because I mean, what else are we going to do? But somehow buying a house gets lumped in there with food groups of being an American, you know, that buying the house is kind of this dream, this American dream that I don't know if you were born here, you were kind of born with it. Or if you moved here, it's like, yeah, that's what we do. We buy a house. That is the definition of financial success, but there's so much that you need to know when you're buying your first home or your second home, or even if you're just preparing to buy your home. I'm Shauna Compton Game. This is Millennial Money, and today we're talking the top tips for first time home buyers with our friend and frequent podcast guest, Vishal from Better. Millennial Money with Shauna Compton Game. It will expand your brain. Whatever you're saving up for, a CD from Sandy Spring Bank lets you grow your savings at a guaranteed rate. Right now, earn interest at 4.5% APY on an 8-month CD special or 4.25% APY on a 14-month CD special. Learn more at sandyspringbank.com slash cdspecials. Minimum opening deposit to earn the annual percentage yield is $500 for the 8-month CD special and $2,500 for the 14-month CD special. Member FDIC. I think about like every third Ask Shauna question I get is something around buying your first home or your second home or flipping homes. There seems to be, you know, a lot of interest in home buying. And this episode was prompted by a question by Aaron who is just totally confused after reading so many different articles and listening to a lot of podcasts about what she needs to do to get in the right position to buy her first house. And, you know, whether you're buying your first house or your second house, or you want to flip houses, I found that no matter how many times you go through the process, it's like we suffer, you know, selective amnesia. And then when we're going through the process again, it's like relearning. It's like relearning, you know, how to ride the bike without the training wheels. And it's just because it's, 
you know, there's all these documents involved, all these numbers and a lot of paperwork, and it just can feel like a, a tricky, I almost said procedure, but uh, that makes it sound really bad, right? It's not quite like you're going in for a medical procedure, but some might argue that buying your house kind of feels like that. It's it's a process, and there are a lot of different details, again, a ton of numbers that fly at you, and just endless amounts of paperwork. And so I thought, you know, we're in the summer and this is traditionally a home buying season. June is traditionally the hottest month to buy or sell your house. And, you know, that trend really is continuing. There are, there are lots of articles about whether now is still a good time to buy a house. Um, there was a recent article, I'm going to link it in the show notes from Go Banking Rates, I thought was really interesting. It was the best and worst states to buy a house. And I found this really fascinating because, you know, often like we can't move from wherever we're at. You know, if your job's in a particular state, like you're not going to just up and move because you happen to be living in one of those quote unquote worst states to buy a house. But I think it's good like food for thought. It's good information. And it's certainly me living in Los Angeles in California. Uh, it makes me look at some of the other states with like saliva dripping down my face. That's really gross. But um, it, it makes me feel like, oh my gosh, I want to move to one of these other states. And it's really horrendous being a financial planner because I am so over analytical of the numbers and of you know, taxes in different states and God, just like so many things that most people don't think about, nor should you think about, but that's just kind of the way my brain's been trained. And so I've been keying in on a couple of different states that uh, Jeff and I have had our eye on for a couple of years now, and I really haven't made a whole lot of progress. In fact, I keep coming back to the same state over and over and over again, which probably should be my sign that that's the state we should move to. But um, in any case, you know, um, I think that there is still such a good environment right now to buy your first house. But I say that with a word of caution. And I recently wrote an article for uh, Go Banking Rates, in fact, about why I was happy that I didn't own a house right now. And I got a ton of negative backlash about it. And I thought it was really interesting because it was written totally from my perspective. And I wasn't saying that you shouldn't own a house because I think owning a house done the right way is one of the smartest investments you can make. But I was merely saying that for me right now at this position in my life, I'm really happy that I don't own a house. Doesn't mean I don't want to own one in the future. In fact, I really do want to own a house in the future, but uh, I'm taking my time and I don't think there's anything wrong with it. But I was just really fascinated about all of the people who had, I mean, they took time to write me really long, lengthy emails about why I was wrong sharing my opinion. This part of being out in the public or influencer or whatever word you want to use, this part is so fascinating to me because everybody has an opinion and people have no qualms in sharing their sometimes harsh opinion with you, you know, to just tell you you're wrong. I mean, it really does build up such a thick skin, I found. And um, I'm the type of person, I don't really like confrontation. And uh, so it's been definitely a learned couple of years of, you know, I throw out definitely all the bad comments. I don't read those. I tend to not read the good ones either because I just want to do what I do. And if you like it, great. And if not, I don't care. You can, you know, go listen to another podcast. Wow. I am certainly going on so many tangents today. Uh, but anyway, the point of this article was that I feel like I am in a place where I want to have an adventure. I want to move somewhere else. I want to even potentially like go live in Europe for six months, which sounds totally nuts and crazy, but I just have this kind of like spark inside of me. And I know that buying a house right now is not a smart move because, you know, you can't just sell your house. And a lot of people are like, oh, well, if I don't like my house, I'll just sell your house. Yeah, you can sell your house, but you don't know what price you're going to get. You don't know how long it's going to take you to sell. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of different factors. So, 
you know, I, I liken it a little bit to like a marriage. It's easy to sign the paperwork and get in there, but it's a little bit tricky to get out of it. Um, so I bought my first house when I was 24 years old and that was really young. And, and I know I've shared this on the podcast before, but I didn't know what I was doing. I just thought, well, that's what, that's what you do after you run a couple years, you just pile together some cash and you buy a house. And we had a very small amount of money in our savings account, if I'm going to be really honest with you, like somewhere around $5,000. It was not very much at all. And we had gone out and looked at houses. We'd gotten pre-approved for a mortgage and we knew kind of the range that, you know, we were to look at. But we went to this house and I remember opening the door and I was like, this is my house. It just screamed my house. And if you've ever bought a house before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's just a feeling that you get. It's just a gut instinct that this is the place you're supposed to live in. And so like we made an offer on this house with $5,000 in our savings account, could barely afford the mortgage payment, but could pay the mortgage payment. And we knew that we had to ask our parents for more money for the down payment. I hadn't gotten okay on that or anything. I just was like a bold, you know, kind of like badass 24 year old that was like, it's just going to all work out. And of course it all did work out and it was such an amazing place to live. I of course let go of the house when I got divorced. And so, uh, you know, after that period of time, I, I just liked not owning a house. I liked being, I moved like three times after I left that house because I thought, well, I'm going to really enjoy this period of my life and I'm going to have fun and I'm going to live in places I've never lived before. I moved down to Long Beach, California and had a condo that I rented that was literally on the beach. It was amazing, probably more than I should have spent, but I was like, man, this is so cool. And so, you know, I just lived it up and I I knew that I didn't want to buy a house again when I got married with Jeff because we just were in kind of this phase of figuring out where we wanted to live and what we wanted our life to look like. And so buying a big asset like that just was not going to make sense. So anyway, the whole point of this story is that buying a house is, is a great investment. It can be just it's so impactful for your finances, but it's also not for everyone at every stage in your life. And it doesn't mean that if you can't buy a house right now or you don't want to buy a house that you aren't somehow financially successful or you're not living the quote unquote dream. I think that kind of talk is ridiculous again when it comes to finances because this thing is called personal finance. So it is literally that it is personal and it's your decisions and your choices. And we're all going to go through these different seasons and stages of life where certain things make more sense. So, you know, you got to kind of decide what what works for you. And, you know, we're still in a great mortgage rate environment. Mortgage rates are still low. They're not as low as they had been, but they are way far away from the highs. And so, you know, it's still a great time to, to get your foot in the door. And, you know, then we got the debate about renting versus buying. And a lot of cities... Uh, you know, a lot of the big cities, you're probably going to end up paying more money renting than you are if you were to buy a house. And, you know, so the argument is, well, I don't have 20% to put down or I'm an entrepreneur and my income's all over the place. And there's a lot of hangups that existed even a few years ago that a lot of these financial technology companies like Better uh, landed. We did a podcast episode about this, different ways to afford your down payment for your house. There are so many ways now to be able to uniquely afford that down payment that if it makes sense for you, if buying a house is the next logical step for you, then you might want to look at these different options and not just discount it because you were like my brash 24-year-old self and only had a very small amount of money in your savings account. And, you know, there are a couple of things, a few things I would say that I definitely learned through the whole house process. And oddly enough, right after we bought the house, I 
uh, my only job, 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 where I worked for someone else that I ever had in my life, I was a marketing director for a mortgage company. So I learned all the ins and outs of mortgages, of I worked with real estate agents. So I really got to see kind of the underbelly of how, how this all worked. Saw the good side, saw the bad side, but I am forever grateful for that experience because I, I can bring a lot of that to these discussions and tell you what you need to be thinking about and also help you throw out the crap that you don't need to be thinking about. But, you know, I would say the main thing is it's just, it's not as scary as you think. Again, there's lots of paperwork, you know, do some wrist circles first and you make sure you practice your signature because you're going to sign about a million documents. Um, but it's just not as scary. And there are a lot of people involved, but there are a lot of people to, to help you through it. And even if you get through the process and you're like, I don't know what the hell I just went through, that's fine as long as you can make the mortgage payment and you're living in your house. I think another thing that I want to share is that you definitely need more money than you think. You need more money than you think when you first purchase the house. You definitely need more money than you think your first few years in the house when you're adjusting to all the expenses and the things that kind of fly up at you. But the flip side of that is that the tax deduction that you get for the interest part of your payment it's really nice. <laughs> it's really, really nice. And it can be really, really helpful when it comes to tax time. So, I mean, there's a benefit. There's no doubting that there's a huge benefit for buying your first house or your second house or whatever number house, you know, you might be on. And, you know, with a word of caution, we, I mean, I am guilty of this. I'm a huge HGTV fan. Like I watch way too much House Hunters. I could probably give you exact specifics of House Hunters International. It's just, it's like on repeat in our house and <laughs> it's really, it's really an addiction. It's ridiculous. But, you know, with all of these different kind of shows and 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 tips and styles and, you know, fixer upper and stars and I had all sorts of things to do with buying houses and fixing up houses, I think it's really important to take your time and do the research for what you're buying and not just buy on aesthetics. You can fix paint. You can fix wallpaper. You can potentially even fix the layout of the house, although I caution you that remodeling is super, super, super expensive. So there's so many different things that you can fix, but see past those aesthetics and really look at the house for itself. But be smart with the appreciation in the house. You know, why do you want to own this house? And I wish somebody had asked me this in the beginning when I bought my first house. I still probably wouldn't have been able to give like a super educated answer back, but it does make sense. You know, are you buying a, a second property where you're going to have it as an investment property or maybe you're going to Airbnb it out? Do you want to um, buy your dream house with the appreciation that you've got in your first house? Do you want to use your appreciation in your house to pay for college for your kids or use it to pay off student loans? Or is your goal really that you just want a house that's paid off when you're in retirement? That's a great objective to have. So, you know, thinking about as much as you can, maybe the end in mind, or maybe you're like, you know what, I just want to live here for five years. I want to see what happens at the end of the five years. And you know, then I'll make different choices with my house. Maybe I want to keep it as an investment property. There's so many different ideas now of how you could turn your house into a legitimate asset that um, I think it's it's really an exciting time. So I wanted to chat with Vishal again from Better, the guys who are really innovating this mortgage process to find out what their top tips were for home buyers so that you could hear from the horse's mouth, if you will, how you can get in a position to buy. And then what happens if you're an entrepreneur? So many of us are 1099ers, you know, and it's like, are we just SOL or do, do we just fall to the bottom of the list? And for a few years, it was tough for entrepreneurs because you know, as an entrepreneur, your objective is to make as much money as you can and then um, write off a lot of stuff so that your taxable income is as low as, you know, humanly possible, as makes sense for your particular business. That's between you and your CPA, and I don't need to know anything about that. <laughs> um, but, you know, there were lots of kind of like hoops. And then the student loan hoop, you, you when you're staring at owing a lot of money on student loans that could really be 
this force that stops you from even thinking about buying your first house. So, you know, I wanted to talk to Vishal and I wanted to find out what are his tips so that Aaron could be informed, so that you can be informed. And look, if you've already bought your first house and maybe you're getting ready to go on your second house, this is just kind of a recap for you of the different things you need to be thinking about. So Vishal, take it away for us. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. But I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. <laughs> I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet, finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Um, and it comes down to the idea that in order to buy a house, um, that there isn't going to be something that they can afford uh, a 20% down payment on. And so since they'll, it'll take forever to, to afford a 20% down payment, uh, let's not do something at all. And I think that's, you know, so they're kind of go hand in hand. One is the availability of mortgages uh, for consumers uh, with as little as 3% down using some of the programs that better is able to leverage uh, with Fannie Mae. And so, you know, on an average American home of three hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars in a major metro area, you can buy a house for as little as ten to fifteen thousand dollars down, which, uh, you know, is is savable. So one, we would say prioritize savings, prioritize getting fifteen to twenty thousand dollars saved so you can get that starter home, starter apartment in where you live today and stop paying rent. Right. Which is only going to then increase your savings. Um, the second uh, big tip is, is that on the student loan side, yes, you could. It feels not only financially gratifying, but it may feel even emotionally gratifying to prepay some of those student loans, to pay those balances down. But the fundamental fact of the matter is, is that there are, again, a number of programs that are available that enable you to roll your student loans into your mortgage payment uh, to, uh, you know, to hold them out for a longer period of time. Uh, there are some features of student loans like deferment, uh, income uh, hardship and other things like that, uh, you know, uh, income contingent payment options that are available. So actually, the right thing to do may be 
uh, to maximize your savings um, that you're going to have to be able to put down the three to five percent down payment on your home rather than prepaying all those student loans down, uh, particularly if you've got government student loans. Sorry. It, it, yeah, if you could just for a sec, you know, uh, that's kind of a new concept, I think, to a lot of listeners. So maybe if you could just take a second and, you know, what would maybe be, you know, a benefit to rolling your student loans into your mortgage? Um, so a couple of things, right? The first is, uh, if you think about the average interest rate on most federal s- Stafford loans, uh, which is going to be the most common student loan that people have, those interest rates are going to range between five to six percent. Um, frequently, wherever you're renting, the average uh, rental rate, you know, as a percentage of the home value is between eight to 10% in most major markets. Um, So that means your landlord is earning 8% uh, on the property that they're renting to you. So if you think about it that way, right, it would make much more sense financially to be able to roll that 6% student loan into a 4% mortgage so that you're not paying 8% on rent Um, is, is probably the most simple way to to think about it. Assuming that you want to pay all your debts off on time, uh, the easiest uh, quote unquote debt to get rid of is your monthly rental payment. The second easiest would be your student loan payment. And then the third, ideally, if you your mortgage empowers you to do both, uh, you know, at a four to five percent interest rate, which is also tax deductible, uh, unlike the other two, uh, then that's uh, that's that's a smart move for everyone to make. Yeah, I love it. Great. Thanks so much for going into some depth. I know that's kind of a new concept for a lot of people. They're like, what? I didn't know I could do that. Yeah, no, there's there's a number of companies, uh, ourselves included at Better.com, uh, that enable you to do that automatically as you go through uh, your uh, getting a pre-approval letter where you're finding out how much uh, house you can actually afford. And you know it'll automatically surface those uh, options available to you uh, online. You don't have to talk to anybody. You can if you want to, but you know th- those are some things uh, that we're doing to empower uh, our first generation, first time home buyer. Uh, you know, from this generation, uh, something uh, that that you know really specifically meets their needs. Um, the the next uh, tip that we have is you know again on the four hundred one k. The four hundred one k if if you're going to max that out. Um, and that's going to come at the expense of saving for the down payment on your home. Uh, I think, you know, you have to sort of look at your options. So what is the rate of return on the 401k versus, um, the rate of return on not renting what, it, you know, you might have an employer match on the 401k. So in, in that case, it makes sense to max that out. Uh, but beyond that, you know, uh, it may not make sense to max that out, but just think about the sort of compound returns that you're earning. Uh, on your 401k versus what you might earn, you know, earn from from not having to rent. Um, the the another one is if you've got a signing bonus, you know, that's something worth noting. It's worth noting even in the application process itself that you've got a signing bonus coming, and that can tr- substantially help you qualify because if you know you've got a signing bonus or a uh, your end of year bonus coming, uh, that can be something where you might want to go start shopping for houses sooner uh, in anticipation of that coming before, you know, you get, you know, the actual house that you can buy. And what about for, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurs or small business owners who, you know, don't have a lot of the kind of corporate perks and maybe their income is a bit flexible? Is there anything that they should keep in mind kind of looking forward before they purchase a house? Yeah, I, I, I think the number one thing to keep in mind is that it is actually possible. Um, you know, technology enabled lenders are able to analyze, uh, two or three 1099s just as easily as they used to be able, as you know, a, 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 a regular like mortgage bank, uh, focused, uh, lender might, you know, do a W2. And so, uh, you know, frequently those folks, uh, I remember my dad, he was a small business owner and he literally thought for forever that, you know, you'd have to save up the entire amount. Uh, of uh, the house in order to go and buy the first house. And then, you know, over time, um, uh, you know, I, I think that, that that misnomer just continues to persist. Uh, so I would say that one, getting a mortgage is possible. It's becoming more and more uh, a thing where even agencies like the Fannie Mae recognize that people earn money very differently uh, in this generation. So I, I, I think we've spoken about the Airbnb 
host program that uh, we helped launch with Fannie Mae, where you can now count Airbnb host income in order to uh, qualify for a mortgage refinance. Uh, we're working to extend that to um, to also use it to uh, purchase a home. So there are programs out there that allow you to, if you agree to put your house on air, you know, if you buy a two bedroom condo or a house uh, and you agree to rent out one of those bedrooms on Airbnb, that you can actually take some of that income from that contractual obligation and and count that into your mortgage. Um, Better is working to also enable, uh, you know, other folks, uh, people who are, you know, on ride sharing, uh, gig economy websites and generating income from that. If they have a long enough period of regular income, that can also be established. And of course, those things used to be harder to compute, but now um, in a digital process, they become much, much easier to establish and to compute. So the bottom line is don't be afraid if you're self-employed or if you've got, you know, multiple 1099s, at least, you know, you know, go to better, see what could be uh, put together for your mortgage. You know, don't let that stop you. That, do not let that stop you. Awesome. And um, I know that you also have some uh, interesting data as well uh, about kind of what's going on in the market. I'd love, I'd love to hear some of that too. Yeah. So uh, we partnered up with uh, one of the, the leading housing policy uh, and, and just general economic policy uh, think tanks in uh, D.C. called the Urban Institute to launch a, a study focused on millennial homeownership. And what are the factors that are you know, bringing uh, that are that are that are making both home ownership such a major important topic in like the public discourse, and also what is ho- holding back uh, this generation, the millennials, from uh, having access to home ownership? And so, uh, you know, the topics uh, that we uh, that we got together in this one report first is about home ownership and wealth creation, and you know, what what does that mean? Uh, basically. Home ownership creates wealth. There's a big intergenerational component to it in that people whose parents own their home, they're just much smarter and more educated about the value of home ownership and the power that it brings, uh, the ability to you know, use it as a vessel for savings, to send your kids to college, the ability to use it to tide over uh, economically difficult times or you know, unemployment or disability or or, or medical issues, and, uh, and 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 since those folks ha- grew up in an environment where their parents owned a home, they're just much more likely to do that. Now, there's an, the second part of it, and this is sort of intertwined. Um, the country as a whole is becoming more diverse, and so uh, as the country is becoming more and more diverse, and the millennial population certainly reflects that, uh, you have a diversity of circumstances. This is not you know, not everyone is, uh, is, is, you know, grew up in a suburb in, you know, in, in a city where uh, in, in the Midwest where everyone around them own their homes. And so it's a more urban demographic. It's uh, more diverse. And so you have, uh, you know, you, you've seen like, for instance, the African-American home ownership rate has, you know, showed a continuous decline from, you know, 2000 onwards, you know, getting to about sure. 13 and a half percent in 2015. Um, you know, down from uh, something like um, 23 percent uh, in 2000. And so what you see is uh, is is this, is effect uh, of, you know, people with who didn't grow up in homes where home ownership was valued, uh, who didn't get to see its beneficial effects are tending to opt away from it. Um, and so. We see the home ownership rate for young adults whose parents were renters is like 14%, whereas the home ownership rate for young adults whose parents owned a home is 31%, almost 2x that. Um, so it's pretty interesting. And you know, this is a cycle that we have to break because what we don't want is the next generation having an even wider gap, right? Not a 2x gap, but like a 4x gap between people whose parents were renters or people whose parents were, were homeowners and, and, and their access to home ownership. The... Third uh, topic that we talked uh, that we learned from the report was that, you know, we continue to see that millennials are, uh, are, 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 are have preferences that uh, cause them to 
have a lower home ownership rate. So they're living in high cost cities where the housing supply is relatively inelastic. So there's a need for real uh, regulatory reform around uh, the development of um, apartment buildings, multifamily housing units in many of these higher cost cities are, um, so that you can have, you know, homes go up, not just across uh, communities and, and, you know, and, and improve the housing supply. The second is that millennials are more likely to delay marriage and childbearing. Um, and, 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 and that means uh, those, those are the, typically the things that lead to home ownership. So we see the marriage rate, you know, has gone down from 52% to 38% uh, amongst young adults. And that means household formation is getting delayed. That means people are coming in and, um, and, and, and wanting to do the, have the life events that, you know, per, uh, that propel home ownership and having that happen at a later date. And then, you know, what we're seeing is, is that getting a mortgage for these people, once they get past all of these things, is still quite difficult. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we th we, across all of these things, um, what we see is effectively the need to reimagine the dialogue around home ownership for this generation. Uh, we need to uh, enhance these consumers' financial awareness, um, streamline the process of actually figuring out how much they can afford rather than them, them having to go through a 60 day long mortgage application process to figure out that, hey, I actually can only afford $273,000, not $300,000. So we better tools uh, for that. And, uh, you know, they're since they're renting, they're renting for like 10, 15, 20 years uh, before they buy a home. That's probably actually the most significant credit obligation that they have on an ongoing basis. And it's not in their credit bureaus at all, right? It's like the student credit card that they had that they signed up for because they got a free t-shirt has a bigger impact than the 10 <laughs> or 15 years that they have of rental income um, and, 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 and rental payments. And so uh, those are some of the things that we're gonna be pushing for from both a policy, uh, local community regulation. And then the, the one thing that we can change by ourselves is really helping people understand how much they can afford and get on the journey to home ownership uh, faster, uh, cheaper, and, you know, to, to get a, a better house uh, um, as fast as they can on better, better.com. And, and so that, that's the, the, you know, we're going to do our part to keep improving the home affordability tools and getting people the exact answer on how much house they can afford, uh, both the max, the minimum payment, all that sort of stuff, uh, as well as we can on better.com. But then, you know, there are a whole bunch of things that, uh, we're trying to get others to be interested in and help us with, um, whether it's zoning regulation, whether it's inclusion of rental payments and credit bureau data, all that stuff. Right. So you're trying to just make this process, thank God, it's so much easier. Um, I bought a house many years ago and it was, you know, is a tough process. So, uh, you know, I think anything that can be done to to better the system, to make people more aware of what they can afford is great. So uh, to wrap this up, if you, if you had to give, you know, one, two, three, a couple different tips to people who are thinking about buying a home, you know, what would you tell them? What are maybe the top three things to just get them in the right position to be ready to buy? Yeah. Uh, so the number one thing is know exactly how much you can afford, right? Because it's a tight housing market. Supply is constrained. Uh, multiple people are just like you are bidding for houses just like the one that you want. And so you may have to stretch a little, in which case knowing exactly where the, the number is that is the house that you can afford is probably pretty important. It's probably the most important thing that you can do. Um, and that number is really easy to find on better.com. Number two, um, really figure out uh, what, what renting for the next couple of years means for you. And, you know, me and, 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 and compute that number because that number might be helpful to keep in mind when you're out shopping for houses. Um, think about sort of family needs that you might have, ch children you might be planning to have, all that sort of stuff, and sort of keep that number in mind because that probably is your buffer number. 
Um, and, and so then, you know, armed with exactly how much house you can afford, your buffer number or, or you know, uh, so what it's going to cost you if you don't buy a home. And then number three, um, really focus on getting that first $15,000 together for a down payment, which will help you buy a nice one to two bedroom place in almost any major market in this country, uh, perhaps outside New York or San Francisco. And even there, uh, in the bulk of, the, of New York and San Francisco, that's affordable. And, uh, and use that as a ladder to, to get started. Um, and then, you know, that, I, I would say those are the top three things. Those are awesome tips. Okay, so tell the listeners where they can go to find out more about Better and uh, to access all your great tools. Great. Uh, get started at Better.com. Uh, use our uh, calculator uh, to figure out how much house you can afford. And uh, then, you know, hopefully you're able to get a better house with a better commute um, in a better school district so you can have a better life. So I guess the moral of the story is don't be scared away from buying your first house, but also be prepared in the same breath. As always, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Shauna Game. And if you love this podcast, do me a favor, share it with your friends, shout it out on social media. All of that helps us grow the podcast. And hey, head on over to the podcast app that you're listening to this episode through and go ahead and leave us a review. Those reviews are so invaluable. They help us spread the word and they help Millennial Money continue to grow. 